There's so many reasons why people come to spiritual direction. And um, one, of them, one of the main ones is discernment. And that's a process where someone has to make a decision. And usually it's a pretty big decision. Um, maybe they're thinking about going into the ministry or maybe they're thinking about getting married. Um, there are times when people are in a job and they're questioning whether that's the right work for them and that there maybe needs to be another work. Um, people come because they want to experience God, but they haven't, so they're just beginning their spiritual journey. People come who are very experienced but want to deepen their relationship with God. Um, people come in crisis. Sometimes that's the spark that brings them in. Um, maybe they are suffered a depression or um, something harsh has happened in their life and they want to be able to process it and deal with it in a spiritual way. Yeah, I, just, I can think of hundreds of reasons. Today I have the pleasure of interviewing Connie Lesenby. Connie is a spiritual director. She's also an architect. She's a member of Gwynedd Meeting, where we're having this interview today. She was at one point the presiding clerk of Gwynedd Meeting, and she, um, she also facilitates group spiritual direction. Thank you, Connie, for agreeing to this interview today. I'm happy to do it. So just to begin, can you tell us what is spiritual direction, or as Quakers often say, spiritual nurture? Um, I guess for each individual it's something different, but um, the way that I was trained in spiritual direction um, was by the Sisters of St. Joseph's, and they follow a model that uh, comes from St. Ignatius. And for me, I think of it as being a midwife working with someone, only a spiritual midwife. And so I um, am waiting with a person as they are exploring their relationship with the divine, with God, with Jesus, whoever it is that's coming up for them. And I'm listening with my spiritual ears to hear the different movements that are going on inside them and um, to ask questions that help that person go deeper, to understand more about their spirituality, to come up with ideas about spiritual practices. So it's a place to um, explore a relationship. Um, it can also be a way of going deeper in a relationship with God. So I see myself as assisting, but it's really between the person and God. Mm -hmm. So what is the direction in that word? Mean. Yeah, so I like to think of it as in north, south, east, and west, um, when you're discerning maybe a path to take in life about work or about marriage or family, um, what direction will I take? Um, other people, I think it's been in the past more authoritative, and um, you would go to spiritual director and they would give you Bible verses and you would read them and study and read certain books, mm -hmm. but I think it's gotten a lot softer than that. and. Um, so I think of it as the four directions. So what happens in a typical spiritual, spiritual nurture session or spiritual direction session? Um, so what usually happens and what I most like to have happen first is that um, there's a period of silent worship. And so myself and the directee will sit quietly and go inward and take some time just to let go of the cares of the day and to allow some space for um, God to come in, uh, for the sacred to come in. And also, it's a time of reflection when you come in thinking you're going to talk about X, Y, Z, but then you realize, oh, there's something else that's emerging that's more important. So it's a good time to just take that space to be in silence. And then I always encourage the um, directee, whenever they're ready, just to begin talking about what's coming up. And we go from there, we usually talk for um, about 45 minutes, but it's, there's a lot of time for silence, and I'll often invite the person back into the silence just to check on where they are 
with their interior space. Um, and then at the end, um, we might talk about what was happening during the session and just draw some conclusions from it. Maybe there's some spiritual exercises that come to mind that we might talk about doing. And uh, then we set up a time for the next meeting. So it takes about an hour. So what drew you to become a spiritual director? Um, I think being in spiritual direction. So I was having a lot of, when I was seeking, I started to have a lot of spiritual experiences and I didn't know where to go with them to talk about them. I really felt confused. And my friends and family were nice, but they were a little skeptical and weren't really ready to hear what I was wanting to talk about. And so I was going to a therapist at the time. He suggested I go to a spiritual director to talk about my spiritual life, which I had never heard of. And so I did that, and it was just great. I, was, um, I felt free to talk about things that I wouldn't normally talk about. And um, so my spiritual director, after a year, she said, you know, would you think about becoming a spiritual director? And I thought, no way, <laughs> or maybe when I'm 80. Um, but I had some uh, dreams that really sparked that um, sureness that, yeah, it was time for me to start that process of becoming a spiritual director. So what was that process? How um, did you become a spiritual director? So uh, I was... My spiritual director was actually a teacher at Chestnut Hill College, and they had a program at the time for, and it was a master's degree in holistic spirituality and spiritual direction. And I looked at all the courses and I thought I would just love to take these courses. And so I went in and had an interview and then I filled out my application. And so I got accepted into the program. And that took me about four years part-time to get a degree. Is there anything more you want to say about your experience of having a spiritual director? working with you? Um, I actually, since that, that was in 1993 that I started in spiritual direction, and I've always had a spiritual director since then. And I usually meet with my director one time a month, which is the normal practice in spiritual direction. Um, and I always feel like it's um, a date with God. So it's a time for me to set aside um, all the other things that I do and just focus on what that relationship is, hap what, what's happening in my relationship with God, and um, see new things or see things in a different way. So I just so value that time. It's, um, it's almost out of time and place. When I go, I feel like I enter another realm, um, and it teaches me. And then I come out, and I always feel renewed and refreshed uh, after doing that. Has there been a time when a spiritual director has really helped you with discernment? Um, yes. I mean, even being with this initial spiritual director, she helped me to work with my dreams and understand what my excitement was about in the dream and, and, and what that would mean for my life. Um, so uh, I have done some discernment around work, too, and having a dual career. That was a big time of discernment. Um, and oftentimes discernment can be about very small things, about what to say to someone or how to say it if I'm not sure. Um, it can be about, you know, maybe uh, volunteer service, whether that's really what I'm called to do or if it's just something that looks enticing. So yeah, there's a lot of ways that that happens. So when you're serving as a spiritual director for someone else, how do you prepare for your time with that person? Um, I do pray about each of my uh, directees that I work with. Um, and I notice during the month when their uh, name would come up or if I have a memory of something they said, and I pay attention to what's happening in my feeling toward that person. And sometimes I might find that there's a lot of anxiety about someone, and then I might go and get some supervision to think about why it might be hard for me to meet with them. Um, but mostly, um, if it's quiet and joyful feeling, then I know that things are going well. Um, before the session, I take 15 minutes, and I sit quietly. I um, try to sort through what's 
on my mind, and then I have sort of a mental image that I give all that to God to hold. And then I ask for God to help me be present to that person and to listen as well as I can and to understand that it's God working with that person and it's not about me. So um, what is your sense of how God is present during a session with you as well as with the other person? Um, that's actually a big part of spiritual direction. And there's, um, as the more that I do spiritual direction, the more that I pick up on the subtle um, sensations in my body about where that person is sort of in um, spiritual depth. And it's interesting because a person can come in, and I might not have met them before, but I'll have this real strong sense that they're in a deep place. and. The thing with doing spiritual direction is I, I tend to go to the place where that person is and to hold that space. And so it's a kind of a sense of vibration. And so I can feel if it's like more surface or if we're going to a quieter, more contemplative level. So I'm always monitoring that. Um, and, and to me, that's a feeling of God's presence. And it can get stronger or it can be lighter. You said you hold that place where the person is. What, is, what does that mean? Um, well, I think it means being very quiet inside myself. I'm, on the one hand, I'm checking how my relationship with God is doing, and if I'm actually looking for guidance, or if I think I'm going to be God and try to give that person advice. And I'm also feeling how, where the other person is when they're talking, and even in their silence. Sometimes the silence can go for a while, and I can feel that when people are um, really engaged. So Connie, you said people come in in a different place. You said some people come in in a deep spiritual place, and sometimes they enter into a session in a, in a more shallow place or a more surface place. Does that shift sometimes during the course of the, your time together? Almost always, it does shift. Um, and a lot of times people might come in with a lot of anxiety. And as they're able to pour out whatever's happened, maybe talk about what the incident was that's brought them to that state, they, I think they're aware that they're laying it out for God. And in a way that I give things over to God, they do that. Um, and then I ask questions to help them focus and look more closely at where God is in that situation. And as they go deeper, they feel more connected. And so you can feel the whole atmosphere in the room shift to be quieter, happier, joyous. Um, those are a lot of the feelings that people have when they are cl feeling closer to God. So when you, um, when you ask a question, what's your intention? What, what do you hope that question will do for the person? Yeah, so the, the, um, I think the first thing is that it needs to be open-ended because it needs to be a question that I can ask and not know the answer to. So it's hopefully going to allow them space to go wherever they need to go and to learn more about themselves. Also, it's um, helpful for their imagination to open up. And what's the role of imagination in spiritual direction or the spiritual life? Yeah, so um, for me, I feel like that is the direct connection that all humans have to the sacred world, to the divine, to God. Um, and that's our medium where that exchange can happen, where you can hear that inward teaching, teacher speaking to you. Um, so I think it's critical to um, have some amount of imagination. And sometimes people say, oh, it's just your imagination. But really, imagination is the place where a lot can happen. So how can you tell when imagination is like a doorway to God or Christ? And when is imagination imaginary? Uh huh. That's a good question. And people often, when they start in spiritual direction and they start working with their imagination, they will say, well, it's just my imagination. It's not real. But there is a place that you get to where, I mean, the directee themselves will say, I know this is God. There's a sureness and a truthfulness about what's happening in it. It's not just a daydream. 
it's more that you've entered into an inner dialogue or an inter, inner sensory experience um, of your spiritual life. When you ask a question, what do you, how do you discern what to focus on? So when someone's speaking, I am listening carefully for certain words or certain feelings that people have. And feelings are really important to listen to. Um, and when people are talking about experience of peace or contentment or um, ecstasy or joy, um, these are states that I'm looking for also quiet or dark or no feeling sometimes is a sense of being in God's presence. So there's a lot of feelings that I'm looking for. And then words, I'm listening for um, words that for that person describe what's sacred and what's personally their image of God. So I'm looking for um, just times that people talk about where, say, they're out in nature and they're at a beautiful scene and there's this just overall feeling that they're safe. Words like safety, I'll listen for that. Um, or I'm held. Or I feel loved. A lot of times there's a deep sense of love. So all of those words I'm looking for and I want to use them as a place for that person to enter and um, find out more about what that's about. What language for God or spirit or Christ do you use when you um, support someone's spiritual journey? Mm -hmm. That's part of that listening process, which is to hear what language a person uses about something that's so intimate and so personal. And everyone has a different language about it, every single person. And so in the beginning, it's really a process of discovery of how that, what that language is for that person. And I always try to use the same language back, just as if you know, someone were speaking Spanish, I would want to speak Spanish back. I would use whatever word they use. If they use the word goddess, I would use that. Um, if the place they're feeling spiritual is about a tree, then I will ask about the tree and the energy of the tree. So I'm used to doing that with people even who don't even have a concept of God. Sometimes I work with people that are um, of a Buddhist tra tradition, and so it will be, um, it will have different images for the sacred. And so I always try to use that. So I notice you, you're mostly using the word God. Are there some people who come to you who, for whom Jesus is the center of their spiritual life? Absolutely. Yes, um, many, for many people, also Mary, also some of the angels, Michael. Um, I have one person that I work with who has a whole entourage, and we just look and see who is it that's helping her that month, who's with her in that session. Um, and it's at different times. Sometimes it's Joseph. Um, it depends on what you're going through, uh, what image is going to come to you that represents that. Do you ever push or provoke someone to see something in a different way or to go deeper? Um, that does happen. And uh, if it does, I usually, that's a point where I have to, afterward, after the session, figure out why I did that. <laughs> because I'm supposed to be the midwife and the support, not the one that's uh, driving the car. And so if I get pushy like that, it's usually something that's coming up in me that I might have to deal with that's keeping me from looking at God. Um, so what I'm actually hoping to do is to evoke in that person, and that's a much better word, um, where they're already headed. And so I'm just listening and helping them get there. Do you ever feel like God is asking you to nudge the person a little with your question? Um, I guess the, the, I feel like God is asking me to listen to where they are and to accept that place. And also, I've learned a lot from like looking myself at God 
and seeing how God reacts to that person, which is usually might be different. And often it's unconditional love, patience, infinite patience. Um, and when I look at that, I see, oh, okay, I can have those things too. But sometimes I don't. <laughs> I'm human. Yeah. So I'm wondering, how can spiritual direction or spiritual nurture help people find a faithful way to live and act in the face of climate change? Or any other really serious global, national situation that we're facing? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that I would have to talk about my own experience with um, dealing spiritually with climate change or one of the bigger problems in the world. And I think with climate change, uh, um, there was a first a sense of denial, um, like I didn't want to hear. And then there was a stage where I recognized that I needed to hear. Um, more information so I would read a lot and then I think when I started to get spiritual about it was when I recognized my feelings and I think I had been keeping them at bay because there's a lot of bad news and so there are moments where I have allowed myself to feel my grief or my anger and a lot of times that does happen in spiritual direction where it feels safe to kind of go into those places because there's someone else there. Um, and I'll just be able to say that out loud or I be able to cry. Um, and once I've connected emotionally, I feel like I'm more in a connected place with God to make decisions about what am what is my piece to do? The, the, I can't do it all, I get that. Um, and so I'm often listening to people that are going through these same phases as they face these big crises that we have on our planet. And um, I feel like I have to do the work too in order to be present to them. And so sometimes they're pushing me because they are in deeper places about it and I'll have to get there too. Um, and it can be really hard, really hard. Um, and so, I mean, you know, sometimes in sessions it can be a feeling of being overwhelmed or feeling like you have to do it all yourself. And oftentimes that takes some real prayer and quietness with God and a reassurance that I don't have to do it all. Um, There's just this one piece. And it's interesting, I mean, that's the Quaker way is to find those doors that open and then another door opens. And it's kind of a very simple but ongoing process over a long period of time. And I found that's been true in my journey about spirituality and, and climate change. Could you describe spiritual direction and how is it the same and how is it different from individual spiritual direction? So group spiritual direction is very similar to individual, only um, the entire group, and usually it's about four or five people. If it gets larger, it gets harder to do, but everyone in the group becomes the spiritual director for the person that's presenting. And so you have maybe three or four people that are listening for all the, you know, what that person is talking about in their spiritual life. And then they each have a chance to ask a question or maybe a series of questions to, of that person, helping them to go deeper into whatever experience they're talking about. Um, so it's, it's often magnified um, and it does become very deep over time. Usually small groups will meet for about nine months, once a month. And um, you get to know people in a way that you never would. And everyone else's story, I think, when I listen to it, it helps me understand and, and remember things that I wouldn't have thought of. And then um, I can talk about those too, and I, but I wouldn't have thought of it in the first place. So. It, the group process is really powerful, and I've been doing leading small groups for since 1990, no, 19, 9, 2000, yeah, small groups. And at the end, I mean, everyone in the group feels so bonded. Like you might never see that person again, but you know that if you did, you would be instantly connected. Um, so it's it's a great way. Some people. Uh, for them, that's the way of entering. They don't think they have enough to talk about an individual spiritual direction. So in a group, 
they feel like that's a, an entrance way that they can feel comfortable. And when you're, you're serving as the facilitator of a group spiritual direction group, what's your role? So um, the way that we do it at Quinid, so I would might be a facilitator for one group, but then there's other people who uh, do it too. So we might have several groups going, and uh, they also have had experience either being a spiritual director themselves or they've been in a spiritual formation program and have done it for a while or just participated in a group for a while. And they're able to um, listen, first of all, to there's a pretty strict time constraint on small groups. And so you have to feel empowered to let a person know when they have one more minute left so that everyone in the group can go. And also if um, the group starts to get off track, which can happen, you start talking about the weather, or, you know, you lose focus, and they, that person can call everyone back to let's let's spend some time in some silence, and and occasionally there's some place where there's a lot of advice giving, and so you might say uh, we well, might want to just pull back from that and just really listen to what this person has to say about their experience. So you mentioned earlier um, supervision. Um, what's the role of supervision or peer supervision for a spiritual director? spiritual nurturer. Yeah, so one of the things that was really important when I was in school that our teachers taught us is that um, we don't want to make this journey alone. There's a lot of times where you're hearing some very deep or maybe some intense stories that you're holding um, and you need to be able to separate yourself out from the other person and also to go through your own feelings about whatever it is that there is happening to them. Um, and so an important person could be an, an individual spiritual director, which would be another director that's trained in supervision, or I have a peer supervision group. And so a group of us from school have been meeting for over 20 years now, um, once a month, and two people will present, and it's always very strictly confidential, and we would never use someone's name, um, but we do talk about ourselves in relationship to the directee and what's going on in that relationship and then the group helps ask by asking these open-ended questions um, the person presenting to go deeper and to talk to God about what the problem is and and usually there's some answers that come out and also it, it clears the air a little bit so then next time you meet with that person you feel like you can be totally present yeah so it's really important and they think they that's kind of a requirement to be a spiritual director what do we need to consider when seeking or offering supervision? Um, so when I am seeking supervision, sometimes it's because something wonderful has happened. Um, you know, maybe a directee had a great experience and I had an amazing experience too, and I have, don't have any place to share that. That's confidential and safe. So a peer group or a supervisor would be a way that I could process what happened. Um, so it doesn't have to be bad things, it could be good things too. And sometimes I struggle, like I would use an example, I had a directee and, and twice in a row I was, um, I, well the first time I missed, I missed the appointment and the second time I was late, um, which never happens. And I had even set an alarm and I missed it. So there, I figured out something was going on in me, and so I asked my peer group if I could present. Um, and they were really helpful in getting me to understand what was going on with me, um, that I needed to go through some emotions about something that the directee was going through so that I could um, be present to her the next time. So that really helped. Can you tell me about a process of evaluation after you've met with someone a few times? Yeah, so when I first meet with someone, I, I talk to them about, I say, this is, um, we're experimenting here, and so I would like us to meet for six or seven sessions once a month. And then at the end, um, we'll, go, we'll each go through a period, a time of evaluation about how the relationship is working and how spiritual our sessions are. And so I have a list of questions that I give to them and to myself, and then we take a month and we pray with those questions. And then uh, we take a session just to go through each of the questions and just to be careful and um, notice how God has been present 
with us or maybe not. And um, it's a way, it's like a point where that person could say, maybe I need a different spiritual director or I need to shift some things in how we do things. And that's happened to me where a directee will say, I really need you to do more of this. Um, and I just have to see if I can do that. And then I say, well, yeah, I could do that. And so it's a kind of, um, you know, relationship tuning in order to proceed. And then we also decide whether we want to keep going. You also um, offer people sometimes the Ignatian retreat in daily life? Yeah, so this was something that I was trained to do in school, and I had to do it myself. Um, and St. Ignatius was a Catholic uh, priest who developed a, um, a way for lay people who had busy lives to take nine or ten months and in inside themselves be on retreat, even if they couldn't take 30 days apart from the world and be in, in silence for 30 days, they could still do it in their regular lives if they're moms with children or if you have a job. Um, and so that is a way, and it's actually, it's for actually deepening your relationship with Jesus. And so it's very specific, and there's been about hundreds of books that have been written about it, but it's a process of going through, um, so each, and you'll meet once a week for an hour with a spiritual director, so it's much more intense. Um, and you'll, you agree to pray every day for an hour with, and I would give Bible verses, depending where they are on the retreat, and you would pray with those, each day would have something new to pray with. And um, through the course of that, it's, you're able to get closer and closer to um, the inward teacher, Jesus. and. Um, so there's a lot of movements that happen in that. So it's a great way if you're doing spiritual formation or feel like, I want something more in my spiritual life. It's a great way to do that. How does the retreat help people to get closer to Jesus? Um, so a lot of what you're doing in um, Ignatian spirituality is you're going into the stories in your imagination. So the Bible has a lot of different stories. And you are putting yourself there and actually interacting with the different people in the story, and it becomes your story. And, you know, like Mary and Joseph will talk to you, or Jesus will talk to you, and you actually get to have conversations and ask questions um, and know yourself better. So it's, uh, that's how it's done. What would you recommend for a person who feels a call to serve as a spiritual director or a spiritual nurturer? Uh, the first thing I would recommend is to go into spiritual direction yourself um, and really bring that into the light with another person and take some time to um, do discernment around it. And also I would say talk to other spiritual directors and see what their process was. Um, research the programs that are available for training. Um, there's uh, you know multiple ones around and you can go away and go to school, or you can do it, you know, remotely. There's so many different possibilities right now, but definitely I would get uh, an education. There's so much to learn from the other spiritual directors and everything that's been written about it. And there's a whole process that you go through in order to uh, learn. And also you want to do a practicum where you have supervision and the people that you're working with know that they're working with someone who's just new to it. Um, and so you do have like an internship where you're working with people and you will write like verbatims, dialogues of what happened and you'll take that to your supervisor and they work with you to talk about um, ways to go deeper, ways to improve. Um, so it's pretty much like spiritual direction only. You're doing it around your work. Well, Connie, how was it to do this interview in these sample uh, spiritual direction sessions? Oh, it was so moving, both of, you know, both experiences for me. Um, you know, just to have those few minutes and that insight into someone else's world and how they're relating to the spiritual world, um, it's always moving to me, always. And it reinforces in me my own spiritual practices and the, the stories that I have to share and it gives me some boldness um, and uh, it makes me want to 
keep doing what I'm doing. <laughs> How wonderful. Yeah. How wonderful. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I appreciate both of you gift. sharing mm. so deeply. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Before we started, you shared that you dreamed that you needed to sing a hymn today. <laughs> yes, that's true. I did. <laughs> did you do that, or do you still need to do that? <laughs> um, I don't really have the words. Uh, if I had them in front of me, maybe I would do it. But um, um, I think the message to me was to just enjoy doing this and to be happy doing it. And you know, it's I, you know, I was a bit nervous. And so um, it was that go into this spirit of singing and everything will be fine. So yeah. I kept returning to that mm-hmm. when I would get nervous. Well, it yeah. was beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs>